We get to do Psalms 119, 70 through 80 today. We are doing the letter Yud or Yod. Um, we had to re-record because I started out on a different letter, but I one of the things I'm loving about going through this 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 whole one, Psalms 119, is not just because we're getting to see the heart of the psalmist, but we're also getting to see the story unfolding backed up by the verses of the psalmist, the story unfolding through the through each one of the letters. We're seeing the power of the father building his house. We're seeing him being loaded with his gifts. We're seeing him becoming the door. We talked about each one of these letters, bringing revelation, connecting us. We're going to keep going all the way through. And today, as we get to Yod, we're going to see that his hand, as it extends to hold on to what's his. This is one of those things. There's a cut. There's another letter we'll talk about later that actually is coming up next. It's we. It's interesting that we have two letters back to back. We have the Kaf and the Yod that both are representative of a hand. And we're going to talk about in a little bit the difference between the two letters. Um, and it's going to be interesting too as we go through this section to see. Look at the the verses in here that actually talk about his hand. I'm going to go ahead and share. Let's get our let's get our uh, screen going here. But again, we're in Psalms 119, 73 through 80. And this is, let's see if we'll get it going. Wait a second. Can you hear? I don't know that if I hit share my, hit, oh, I did good. Yes, it's working.
<clears throat> I am in really enjoying the, the um, I'm going to actually go ahead and scooch here really quick. I'll go back. I'm enjoying um, listening to those because if you're listening to those, I, I really encourage it, like, especially like on a, on a prep day or whatever, just listening to those over and over and over each week. Can I have someone unmute themselves and volunteer and read, read for me? I know we heard the song, but I'd love to hear someone. Oh, what happened? There we go. Stay. Stay, little sheep. Okay. Could someone unmute? Thanks, Amanda. Go for it. Your hands have made me and formed me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you will see me and be glad because I have put my hope in your word. Yahweh, I know that your judgments are righteous, that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Please let your loving kindness be for my comfort according to your word to your servant. Let your tender mercies come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. Let the proud be disappointed, for they have overthrown me wrongfully. I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me. They will know your statutes. Let my heart be blameless toward your decrees that I may not be disappointed. Amen. Thank you, Father. All right. Don't get sick as I scooch back now. Okay. So as we start in this, I have to keep moving my little, I'm going to do this. Okay. I think we have one more to go. Nope. That's it. One of the things that's interesting when I was when I was doing some studying on this, uh, a lot of the rabbis will say that it was it's really stressful for them, you know, reading through these some of these portions because thinking of God as having human characteristics, like having a hand, or that He is human in any concept, is is like anti-Jewish. They're like, no, this goes against everything. And I was thinking as I was listening to the different ones saying that how. Um, how hard it is for them when we talk about the word becoming flesh, when we talk about Yeshua being, being God incarnate, right? And that he is a man walking among us. That just is just so against the deep Jewish nature of them. And, and we have to respect the fact that the reason is because they see our God. We see, they see Adonai, they see him as so, they hold him in such respect that maybe a little bit as Westerners, we're a little bit flippant about, you know, um, we're a little bit flippant about our ability to just run to the throne, right? As opposed to there's a process to getting into the king's presence. So I just wanted to share that with you, that when you hear things like this, like talking, we're talking, we start this, this verses off that your hands have made me and they have formed me is the actual picture of his hands, you know, so what they're saying, what they say is this is absolutely a metaphor. And actually, when you look at Genesis and you look about how, how it talks about being formed, it doesn't really say that it says that he blew his breath in there. And and here we're hearing, you're hearing the, the full picture of him actually making us. He, David is saying, you made me. You're going to see this in here, the hand, which is interesting, of course, as he's doing this, it's kind of fun. Some of the other ones didn't quite, weren't quite so easy to see like what that, where is the tet in this? Even though we'll look at it in Hebrew and see that maybe the tet was the beginning of it, each word. This one is, seems really blatant to us, right? Right off the bat, we see yod and we'll talk about later how it means a hand. And the first word is, is your hands have made me and formed me. And, and then he jumps into the next thing, right next thing. He says, give me understanding that I may learn your mitzvah. Give me understanding that I understand your Torah, that I understand who you are, that I understand all the things that are you. You know, I love that this is telling us this now, because for those of us who are live and we're recording this, we're in a section of the Torah portion in Deuteronomy where he says to them, this is not too hard for you. And, and we see David here saying, make me understand. Well, it was interesting to me. I was asking myself, like, why don't you learn first? It says, make me understand so that I can learn. Make me understand so that I can learn. Don't you learn so then you can understand? So it's, so I sat in that and I did a quite a, quite a bit of research. And I would love if, if someone, please feel free to unmute yourself. And, and if you have an understanding of this, that's different. But what I have, what I found in different places was, that the whole concept of that 
We are born knowing Torah. We are born having it written on our DNA. We are born with it already inside of us. And then the process then is now about us understanding it because we know it. Uh, we know it. And then as we know it and we understand it, then we start learning it. And we start walking it out. Um, we are spiritual beings having a physical experience. But we also are, I mean, think about it. We also still are a physical being having a spiritual experience. I don't know about you, but I, in my physical body, I have had some pretty spiritual experiences. But at the same time, I know that deep inside of me, there's a spirit that is living in my body that will return back to the Father's presence. It will leave me. That spirit, that, that deep part of me, that pe deep part of me that groans, that groans out and prays when I don't know the words to pray, that spiritual being is also having a physical experience. So I think that there's this thing happening uh, where there's two, two things happening at the same time. I'm going to understand. I understand. Help me understand so then I can learn. Help my spirit understand. Bring understanding and light to my spirit so this physical part of me can understand. And then he jumps in and says, in faithfulness, you afflicted me. I don't know about you, but um, a lot of times you'll hear um, people say, well, nothing bad. God doesn't send bad things to you. Bad things don't happen from God. He just only gives good and perfect gifts. Well, sometimes a good and perfect gift, I mean, sometimes is, is a, is a uh, restriction or a limitation, right? That's a good and perfect gift. A good and perfect gift for Adam and Hava was to have them leave the garden because if, if the gift w was eternal life in there, well, the, he had to adjust the gift and, 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 and have them leave the garden because if they stayed in the garden, they would have stayed in an eternal state of their sin. And that couldn't happen. So what he ended up doing is what a gift he gave them. The gift, the good and perfect gift was saying, I'm going to send you out. And then we get the redemptive process that's going on even for us today, right? So we can work this out and we actually have eternal life because of that. So Give me understanding. The word is being, and it means to separate or to distinguish. So, so when I have an, a thought of what the word understanding means, it doesn't necessarily in my mind mean to separate or distinguish. In my mind, when I think of what does understand mean, it means to know something and be able to apply it. Um, and then when I see this in the Hebrew, the word being, where it says to separate, give me Give me the ability to separate and to distinguish. Oh, okay. Well, let me reread this again. Father, um, give me the ability to separate and distinguish so that I can learn your ways, your mitzvah. So, so if we sit in that I just sat in that for a minute and I want you, I'm encouraging you and inviting you to sit in this with me, being, to separate, to distinguish. If that's your word of the week, Father, think about, your, you know, what do we talk about? We talked about earlier about a sword separating truth and, and lies. We, what is it that, se Father, show me how to separate. Show me how to separate and distinguish between what is good and what is God. Because sometimes I think some of us might be stuck in the middle, right? We're stuck in the middle between two good things and we don't know which way to go. Separate and distinguish so that I understand your ways. I understand, Father, what are your ways in my life right now? How do I separate and distinguish how to raise my children? How to be a wife? How to be a friend? How do I separate and distinguish to know your ways? Because uh, your ways are way above my ways. And your understanding is way above my understanding, the way that you separate and distinguish things. I just want to just kind of let that word sink in with you, being. Being, it means to separate and to distinguish. Does the word understanding kind of make sense? Sort of. But if you sit in that and say, Father, show me how to separate and distinguish your ways, doesn't that come alive a little bit more? It, it did for me. Did I go too fast? Oh, I did good. Yay. <clears throat> so, 
So the next verse in verse 74, when he says, those in all of you see me and they rejoice because I put my hope in your word. You know, one of the great examples of a great leader is someone who follows Torah, especially back in those days, right? If you saw your king writing out his Torah, you saw your king um, knowing that he was trying to walk out the mitzvah, you know, your king is honoring and loving Torah and wanting to do the ways. This is his heart's cry. So when they see this, that's what he's referring to. They see me and they rejoice. The reason they see him in awe is because they he has put his hope in your word. I have shared this story before, but it's worth repeating. I was in a custody battle with my daughter and we showed up to the to the uh, to, to the courtroom. We had agreed in advance that we were not going to have attorneys and we were going to go in and, and it wasn't just custody. It was it was it was a lot of things were going, you know, it was part of a divorce. So it was always drama, right? So we go in there and my ex-husband showed up with an attorney and I walked in and instantly the, the verses are flooding over me, right? Do not think about what you're going to say before you go before the magistrate. And I was like, okay, father, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you. I'm going to trust you even in this. I'm going to trust you, father, that you've gone before me. The judge walks in, he stops before he takes his seat and he bows his head and he says a prayer. I had full trust in that man going forward. I was in awe to see, and I rejoiced in the fact that I know that he was putting his hope in God. He was, be, he was doing that thing where he, the bean, he was preparing his heart and his mind to be able to separate what was good, what was just, what was the right thing to do. When he did that instantly, I saw the picture of Solomon. I mean, King Solomon, when he came on the throne with the women with the baby, instantly I saw the fact and I knew that was this moment. And my God not only was going to take care of me, but it was going to be the right thing. And that's what's happening here. A great leader sets the example. What's the example? The ultimate example is that you are following Torah. That's the ultimate example that they see. I mean, you guys do not want me to, you expect that. Oh, well, you expect, I know how to use a PowerPoint. That's probably one thing you expect. <laughs> you expect that when I show up, that there's some semblance of study. You expect that there's some part of me that's actually walking out Torah. You expect that there's some part of me that has spent some time in his word. There's an ex expectation to follow me in this group, in this class, as a leader, that there's some example that I've set, that I'm following mitzvah, that I'm following some things. And that's what you get to do in your homes. The example you set is that you're saying, I trust in you, Father. I trust in you. And we're going to keep going on in this, right? In, in his trust as we see this. The people want to see their leader studying and living out the Torah. And he says, they see me and they rejoice. That seems funny, right? But they don't. Isn't there a comfort? Isn't there, a, there's a comfort that me when I walk past the, the my husband's uh, office and I see him sitting in there and he has uh, his Torah open. He has the, the book, the, his Bible open, or he has a Kumash open, or he has a study book open. My heart rejoices. And I believe that your husband and your children, even though they may not admit it now, but later they will say their heart somewhere rejoices as the leader of your home. As they see you studying his word, they see you doing the things that they know are making you a great leader to know be able to be in, to be able to distinguish and separate between what is the way that, that we should go, what is the things we should do, because you are studying and your his Torah is in you as you walk out his ways. So that when people see you, do they rejoice? Do they rejoice because they see that in you, in your in your work? Maybe if you work outside of your home, do they see that in you? I know, I'm sorry, I thought my phone is on. Do not disturb. Apparently it's not. Um, I'm gonna turn it off. The, um, a great leader, I'm thinking about just so many different places that I've gone in where, uh, I've had places that have you ever gone to work somewhere and they actually, um, um, pray before you start to work, or there's a, there's a, there's a rejoicing that happens inside of you when you see good things happening. So I want to encourage you. I want to encourage that your neighbors see it. I want to encourage you that again, that your children see it. I want to encourage you that you're. Uh, if you are leading a team, maybe you have a business and you have a team that they see it. I'm encouraging you that you can say this just like he's, he does here in verse 74. Those in awe of you see me and rejoice. See, it takes those, those who know him, 
you know, you know him. So you, when you see one of your leaders, even here, and you know that they've spent time in the presence of God studying his word, there's a part of you that rejoices, right? Because of that hope. <clears throat> he says, the next thing he says is, I know Adonai that your judgments are just in faithfulness. You have afflicted me. This is a harder one. In faithfulness, you have afflicted me. But God doesn't do bad things to us. But he says here, in faithfulness, you have afflicted me. He's saying here, God, I know everything is fair. David isn't in, doesn't have a crisis of faith here. He's not, when you look at his life, his life was kind of a hot mess. He had some things happen to him. He also did some things that maybe caused that. We talk about Bathsheba. We can say, yep, that when you kind of caused it on yourself. But when we look at other things, when he's running and having to hide, like, can you imagine being told you're going to be king? And then for most of your life, you're running and you're hiding from the current king who's trying to kill you. That does, that is counterproductive. That is, con that is the contra name. <laughs> you told me I'm going to be king, but now the king's trying to kill me. But he says, I know that you're fair. I've seen this from the beginning. I trusted in you. He's not having a crisis of faith. I want to encourage you in this verse. Father, you are fair. I know right now there are promises that you've spoken over my life. I know that you are trustworthy. I know that you have acted faithfully in every single thing. We talk about the emunah life. It is all good. Romans 8, 28. It is all good. When it's bad, it is all good. I want you to say it out in your house. It is all good. Is it when it's bad? Everyone say it. It is all good. When it's good, I can't hear you. Did you say it? Everyone say it really loud. It is all good. He's saying, I know that your ju judgments are righteous and that your afflictions are trustworthy. I know that you're not going to lead me in a path that isn't righteous. I know it. I know it. I know it. I don't ask, how can you do this to me? I'm not going to sit around, Father, why did you do this to me? Why did you let this happen? I, sometimes, I don't know. Did David do that? A couple of times. I think some, I always tease and say uh, David's a little bipolar because sometimes he's like, <laughs> and then the next minute he's like, oh. so it's a little funny. But he says, I know. He's not saying in here, I hope. I pray, I think. He says, I know. I know. I think if you are a writer in your Bible, you should circle it. I know, Adonai, that your judgments are just. Things, again, didn't go, go easy for David. And we talked about those examples. But everything he knows happens for a reason. There is nothing empty in this life. And we have to grab onto that. And I apologize. I'll have to grab the verse from Isaiah. I didn't go back and fill it in talking about his righteousness and his ways are right. His, his justice is right. Everything that he does is right. We also, if you're listening right now live, um, yeah, that word should be trustworthy. Moshe also tells us that God is trustworthy. I'm going to go back in and read it to you in Deuteronomy. We're, we're about ready to go into this next, in the next couple of weeks. We're at the end in this season. If you're, you're live with us, you know that in, or if you're listening at least during the same week, in Deuteronomy uh, 32, verse 4, he says, this is Moshe's song. This is his song uh, leaving, you know, this is his gift to everyone as he's leaving his song. It says, the rock, blameless is his work. Indeed, all his ways are just. God of faithfulness without iniquity, righteous and upright is he. The rock, blameless is his work. Indeed, all his ways are just. All his ways are just. That's Deuteronomy 32, 4. All his ways are. But Charlie, you do not know what I'm going through. I am in, I'm, I'm between a rock and a hard place. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be homeless. I'm going to be, I know. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that, 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 that it's we always say, I would say, it's not fair. And I remember the first time Brenda said to me, that fair is not a fruit of the spirit. I would always say, I, I don't know about you, but I always be like, why do I have to be the one that changes all the time? Why do all this, why does this happen 
these situations happen, especially like with a spouse, even a friend, but th this, most of the time it was with Randy or, and I'd be like, why do I have to be the one that changes all the time? It's just not fair that God makes me be the one to, and fair is not a fruit of the spirit. What we think is fair is not necessarily just, we have to trust his sovereignty. And I think that you know, over year, over year, the longer you're here, the longer you're with us, you're going to hear the word sovereignty so much that you're going to want to scream, but it, we have to get it. Our brain, I think the moment that we can truly grasp his sovereignty is the moment that we are set free. It's the moment that we can be like Paul and say, I am, I'm, I'm, I can be happy in nothing and I can be happy in a lot, which seems like a crazy statement to say, right? I can be happy in a lot. Well, anybody can be happy in a lot. Can I, can I review that? Because recently there has been a change in my life and I have gone from a situation to where I felt like from the moment of being a single mom through being going through moments of being homeless to being almost homeless to struggling and losing businesses we have struggled it feels like it has been a fight it has been hard and this year uh something has happened it is i i won't say like oh my gosh we are just like rolling in the money i'm not saying that but but there's a something that's happened it's like a like a piece. And for the first time, I'm not thinking I'm in the middle of the storm and I'm waiting for the next wind to hit because I've lived my whole life when I had a good day, just preparing because I know any minute the shoe's going to drop. So I got to get ready for the bad day. And being able to be thankful, to be in, able to be able to sit in a place where you can say, I am good in a lot and I'm good in nothing because I am trusting. I know like David, I know that your judgments are just and that you have afflicted me because there's a reason. So could we get to a radical crazy place? I, I recommend you read the garden of gratitude. It is highly rabbinical. It will ruin your life. <laughs> I can count how many people, the, everyone I know who has read it will tell the same, tell you the same thing. You could read maybe one or two pages a day, maybe, maybe a paragraph and you have to set it down. I've thrown the book across the room a few times. Uh, it's one of those books, the garden of Grat gratitude by Shalomo Arus. I'm telling you, this is a book that will change your life because he's going to teach you that it is all good. You've afflicted me. It is all good. And to be able to be in that place where you stand there and you say, thank you, God, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then what happens? The shalom of God, that place of unfracturedness, the peace of God that transcends all understanding, guard your heart and your mind. I think that's where I'm at right now. I'm in a place where all of a sudden I've, I've gotten into a practice where I thank him for the good, the bad, and the ugly. Thank you, Father, because you've got a plan for this. This affliction is for a reason. Show me what it is. And you're going to hear me saying it over and over because I want to give you hope that wherever you're at, if you can, no matter where you're at, get to a place where you're saying it is good. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for this. Thank you, Father, for this, this mess that I created. This, this mess that I had to have this job and it wasn't the right job. And now I'm fighting. Show me father, this husband I had to have. And I, maybe I got into something I shouldn't therefore wanting to have another child. And maybe now I'm stressed out or maybe I invited, maybe I put on this big event and now I, it's like, I'm going to have a big, I don't know, maybe in the holidays, you've overdone it. Father, thank you. I'm going to laugh at myself right now because father, thank you. You know, I did this to myself. Uh, I'm in this relationship and I did it to myself. I've, I've made these commitments and I did it to myself, excuse me, but I thank you because you already knew you've already been in today. You already knew I was going to be crazy like this. You already knew you allowed this affliction. You allowed me to do it because you want to teach me something. So show me now how to walk this out in grace with a smile, with your fragrance, to laugh at the days to come. Show me how to be thankful for even the things that I do to myself. Show me how to do that, Lord. That word afflicted me is anah. Ooh, you got two Hebrew words today. Anah. 
you have afflicted me, Anna. That word right here, if you see it, you have to bestow labor upon anything to exercise oneself in anything. So if we look on this, it's like tilling up the ground to bring earth to its cultivation. Oh, well, wait a minute. What? You have afflicted me. You have bestowed labor upon something on me that's caused me to feel like I'm labor. Oh, let's look back at thing about Adam, that labor, he was caused to labor the ground. He would now have to till the ground, right? So let's keep that picture in mind. When we I, initially, I said he had to leave the garden was actually a gift. So if there, he would have bestowed labor upon the thing. Now this is out of the blue letter Bible. And this is the Gesenius uh, uh, Chaldean uh, lexicon. Okay. So it says to bestow labor upon a thing. And what is it? Why is it doing it? Is to till up the ground, to bring the earth into cultivation. That's the first section of this. And we talk about that's the first meaning. The rest of this is sprinkles. What does it mean to be afflicted, depressed, oppressed? This will happen to you because who, who, who whistles while they work, while they're chopping up the ground and getting it ready for cultivation to submit oneself to anyone. Oh, it's a part of submission. We can keep on going down. Um, but what else is, can we get on here? Oppressed to be afflicted. Well, we go back up to the beginning. We'll scoot back up because you're going to look at the other ways that verse is used. Going back to the beginning. I hope this sparks some life in you. What's happening in your life to be afflicted for this word, Ana? This word says, you have caused me to till the ground up in places in my life because they are not fruitful and cannot multiply until I till the ground up, until I get the rocks out of the way, until I get rid of all the stuff so that it's ready to plant. It's ready to be watered. It's ready to be cultivated. You have caused me to labor there from now on. I'm not just going to be, let's listen to Adam. Remember before he would just know the things and he could do, he could just walk through and just pick things and eat and be fine. And God says, from now on, you're going to have to cultivate the soil, everything in your life from now on, because, because you missed the mark because of the hatat, you've missed this mark. What's I'm going to cause this affliction on you now that it's going to cause you to have to work so that you till this soil up so that now these things can be planted back in you. That's what's going to happen. But it's because I love you. Because I want you to be co-labor with me in this process. I could snap my fingers. God could do that any minute. I say, I, God, Lord, forgive me. God could snap his fingers at any moment and make it happen. And, make, and ha does that happen sometimes? Yeah, rarely. But what he's saying here is, you have, let's go back to, you have afflicted me. Let's reread it this way. I know, Adonai, that your judgments are just. In faithfulness, in faithfulness, you have caused me, you have caused me to till the ground and to bring the earth into cultivation. You've caused me to labor and to exercise myself, to push a muscle because it hurts. I've got to build new muscles because I'm going into new places and I'm trying to till up the ground that maybe I've, maybe, you know, from one season to another in a garden, you know what happens. You have to retill it up every single year and maybe you planted some bad stuff. Maybe you've planted some bad seeds and he's saying, I am going to afflict you. Well, no, let's go back. I am going to annoy you. I'm going to cause you to till this ground up so that this earth can be cultivated. So this, we're going to, we can furrow it then, and we can plant good stuff in here again. His mercies are new every single morning. I hope you're embracing this. I couldn't hardly, I couldn't get past this. He has afflicted me, Anna. I've already read through this one. The yod, really quickly, we're just going to scoot through this and then I, we'll, do our, we'll do our chat time. But yod is a hand. It's the father holding what's his. It's the yod. It's the father holding what's his. Picture him holding you. Most holy things are start with the letter yod. We look at Yahweh, Yehovah. You want you to look at all the words that start with the letter yod. Yod is the active hand. I Sorry, it wasn't Yahweh. Ignore my verbiage here. It's Yod is the active hand grasping hold of things. Okay, so we talked about the next letter we're going to go into is Kaf. And Kaf is actually, on the other hand, an open hand that's giving and receiving. So the Yod is this active hand holding and grasping onto you, holding and grasping things. 
And it represents that personal power and possession. It represents God saying, this is mine. This is mine. So I'm going to watch over and take it. Whereas we get to the cop and he's saying, my hand is open. This is my hand giving and receiving. The yod is also part of all the other letters. If you go through and you look at you'll, you'll see how the letters are, are, we don't ever get into this in this class, but if you go into Brenda's Discovering the Energy of the Letter, she'll talk about, oh, this letter is a yod and a cough, or this letter is a yod and an olive, or, you know, they're put together to actually, the yod is, he's saying, this is mine, 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 right? <laughs> Finding Nemo, all the letters, mine, 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 mine. He's saying, this is mine, and the value is 10. All right. I am going to stop sharing here. Oops. I'm going to stop sharing here. And I want to uh, hear from you guys now. What do we got? Love this. Amanda says, it's not if, but when he afflicts us. It's not if, it's when he causes us to labor and turn up the soil, right? It's not if, it's when that happens, right? It's when, when, when that happens. Very good. I'm going to just read a couple of the things. Uh, Amanda also says, yes, they will. Our children will see it. I've watched my adult son finally admit, even though for years he did it, it comes young mamas. It sure does. You know what? One of my best memories of my mother is having her, seeing her at the end of her bed praying and hearing her call out everyone's names, praying over them, calling out their names, calling out their names. That's one of my best memories of my mother. I love it so much. Love, love, love it. Let's go ahead and stop the recording and then we'll go to Q&A and see how we do and hear just a little discussion. <laughs> 